I'm going to do part two this morning of Dress for Battle, <clears throat> and I want to start off with this. I want to read a couple, two, two passages of Scripture which should change the way you ever go to church again. Just two passages should change the way you ever go to church again. If you have cell phones, we're asking that you abstain from goofing off on them while we're preaching. Let's honor the word of God with our full attention. And here's what I want to share this with you. Silence it. If it's the ringer's on, turn it off. If you can't control it, give it to your neighbor and say, give it back to me after the service. Amen. Mark 4, 24 says this. Now, I want to read this from the Amplified. When I saw this many, many, many years ago, it changed forever the way I attend church or the way I listen to preaching. I'm going to read this from the Amplified translation. And he said unto them, be careful what you are hearing. The measure of thought and study you give to truth you hear will be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you, and more besides this, will be given to you who hear. For to him who has will more be given, but from him who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away by force. Luke 8, 18 says, Be careful, therefore, how you Listen, for to him who has spiritual knowledge will more be given. And from him who does not have spiritual knowledge, even what he thinks and guesses and supposes that he has will be taken away. Did you hear that? How you hear the word of God when it is taught determines how it will work in your life. If you give it your full attention and study, the Bible says it will work greatly for you. But if you don't, it won't. And even what you've heard that may be God in will be taken away from you. Now that should forever change how you read your Bible, how you hear the Bible taught. That should forever change you. And if it don't, you, did, you missed it already because you weren't listening. Turn around someone and say, take heed how you listen for these next 12 hours. <laughs> See, some of you are already listening. <laughs> Amen. We'll give you a bathroom break, though, at six hours, so relax. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, Luke chapter 13, verse 23, and I always encourage taking notes, whether you're taking notes on your device or whether you're writing, take notes. Why? Again, take heed how you hear it. It is a proven fact that you will forget 90% of what I'm about to speak, but if you just simply take notes, you'll increase that. You'll increase that. And if you really think about it later, you'll even more increase that. You know, there's only one place where you have 90% retention of what you hear, and that's when you teach it. Amen. So if you share what you learned this morning with someone else, you'll have a 90% retention rate. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Everybody say, stack the deck in your favor. <laughs> Amen. Luke 13, 23 then one said to him, Lord, are there a few who are saved? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Now, if you're through the gate today, if you made it through the gate, you're one of the few. You are a great minority on planet Earth. Millions could not enter 
but you did. So that's good news. That's good news. But there is a striving to serve in Jesus. That's what we're talking about, the battle. Being prepared, being dressed for battle. You know, most of you growing up, now kids are weird today. They wear shorts in February. Now, I don't know if that's poor parenting or just dumb kids. But <laughs> when I see a kid with shorts on in February, I'm like, are you all right? Did your mom like drop you when you were three days old or what? I mean, shorts in February, but that's the way kids are today. But uh, my mom always told me, dress for the weather. Amen. Dress for the weather. And you know, I see people walking down the street. I saw the other day, I saw a mailman over here around Broad Street. He had on tennis shoes and shorts walking through six inches of snow. And I just thought to myself, you're crazy. <laughs> I just thought, you're nuts. You can't tell me you're not cold. But I don't know. Some people just have a greater, I guess, uh, people like pain, I guess, <laughs> and discomfort. But we have to be prepared for the things we're going to face. Amen? Colder it gets, the bigger my coats get. I actually have a 60-degree coat, even a 70-degree jacket. I, my coats change. I literally I have them stacked in my closet. I have my 60 degree, 45 degree, 30 degree, and under 30 degree coat. Some people say, you have too much time on your hands. No, I don't like to be cold. If I got to live up here with you folks, I'm going to stay warm. But you know, everything we do, there's preparation for. Everything we do, there's preparation for. When it comes to walking with God, Jesus' descriptive terms were very exclusive. Very exclusive. Inner strive, number one. That means this ain't gonna be easy. Narrow gate. That means not very many folks are gonna get through it. So this is a battle from day one. You know, if you prayed this morning to receive Christ or renew Christ in your heart, Guess what? Get your sword ready. Get your shield ready. Because the fight's on. You weren't any threat to the kingdom of darkness, maybe before, but you are now. You, weren't, you know, you're not much of a threat to the kingdom of darkness if you won't confess him before men. But the minute you stand up and you say, I'm a believer. Amen. We used to sing a song years ago. And I loved the song for baptisms. And the song went like this. I have decided I'm going to live like a believer. Turn my back on the deceiver. I'm going to live what I believe. Amen. When you start doing this thing, all of a sudden, you get a big old bullseye on you. And I've heard testimonies for 40 years. Man, Dave... It almost seems like things have gotten worse since I came to your church. And I said, then you know you're in the right church. <laughs> because if the devil pats you on the back for the church you're attending, you better believe you're now on his team. Amen? But if he fights you tooth and nail and he fights every step you try to take towards God, you know you're on the right team. <clears throat> you know you win in this battle. Amen? Because he goes on to say, for I say to you, many will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. He'll answer and say to you, I don't know you. Where are you from? Boy, wouldn't that be a bad thing to hear when you knock on the gates of heaven. Wouldn't that be horrible? Horrible thing to hear. 
When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, you'll begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, open for us. And he'll answer and say, I don't know you. Where are you from? And then you'll begin to say, but wait a minute. We ate and drank in your presence. You taught in our streets. And he'll say, I don't know you. Where are you from? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And that in our translate, in our day, People day, you walk up to the, uh, a, a standard kid on the street and you say, you worker of iniquity, and he'll look at you and say, what? What the heck is that? That means you who practice sin in your life. Sin is normal for you. Sin is normal for you. He says, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves are thrust out. I want to keep the fear of God before you every Sunday. Because I'm telling you, these folks thought they were okay. You know, when, when Micah started singing that a little while ago, Micah's a beautiful testimony of a church kid. Where you at, Micah? Oh, he's in, he's in over there. Micah's a beautiful example of a church kid. Where you at, Mom and, Micah's mom and dad, where you at? They're upstairs, too. Huh? Oh, in the balcony. What are you, backslide or what? Get down here. What's the matter with you people? <laughs> it's hard for me to see your faces up there. Although, Trent, you do have that beautiful light shining off that bald head. I'm telling you, it just... A reflection of glory up there. Amen. But, you know, here, here you see Trent and Amy Bowles. You know, they raised their boys, all their boys in church. Good church kids. And all four of them ended up lost. All four of them have gotten up and said, at some point in time, you know, I need Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. And as a mom and dad, we we're like, what? We didn't know you were lost. We raised you in church. But as we say weekly, every generation has to find Jesus as Lord and Savior. Christianity doesn't happen by osmosis. You don't get saved because you're in the room with mom and dad. You get saved because Jesus becomes real to you. And you must, you know, I love what Kevin says, our good friend Kevin Leal. He says, God has no grandchildren. Did you hear that? God has no grandchildren. He only has children. You can't be related to him through some other person than Jesus. And Jesus doesn't call you a grandchild. He calls you a brother. So God has no grandchildren. You got to know him. And you know, I, I was listening yesterday. I spent most of the day yesterday in the scriptures and I was listening to a beautiful message by that great man of God. He's in heaven now, David Wilkerson. And he had done a message. He was 75 years old when he did the message. And it was to a bunch of young believers. And he said, don't lose the anointing. And he shared about when he became famous as a preacher. You know, for, for you younger guys, you won't remember this. But back in my day, when I first got saved, his book, it was called The Cross and the Switchblade, he was one of the most famous preachers in the world because he got a burden and he moved to New York City back when it was, well, it's getting bad again, but before Rudy reformed New York City, it was really bad when the gangs were ruling the streets. And he went into New York City and he converted the biggest gang leader in New York City, Nicky Cruz. And his his story was called The Cross and the Switchblade. And his church became a bunch of ex-gang members. And he became world famous when the publishers got a hold of that. And he started talking about how he got, he got the big touring buses, began to tour all over the America and go all over the world preaching. And he made this statement to these young preachers. He said, I got so busy working for Jesus that one day I woke up and realized I didn't even know him anymore. Working for God never replaces knowing God. And I can attest at times in my life where we've gotten so busy in ministry 
that I had to stop and say, wait a minute. I'm praying, I'm praying to him, but I'm not conversing with him. It's so easy for prayer to become like a one-way microphone. But without that conversing daily, without that daily, and it's a battle to keep your mind in a place and time of prayer where you're not just saying words and saying, okay, I did it. I punched my time clock. Heaven, you got that record? I prayed for 20 minutes today. I'm good now. I'm going to live my day. That's not prayer. That's a religious form of prayer, but that's not really communion with God. <clears throat> Communion's always got to be a two-way conversation. Have you ever had someone, and I uh, hope it wasn't me, but uh, someone who you had a conversation with, but you didn't get a word in? And at the end of the conversation, they went, great talk, and you were thinking, yeah, for you. Because I didn't say a word. You dominated every conversation. You know, I'm a talker. I make a living with my mouth. And sometimes my wife will say, David, you, you didn't even let them talk. You talked the whole time we were at dinner. And I'm like, so? That's <laughs> what I do. <laughs> and again, that's not communion. And for us talkers, it's harder to be still than it is to talk. And for you introverts, it's harder to talk than to just let us talkers run all over the thing, right? So we have to, each of us has our battles in communion. For me, it's listening. For you, it might be talking. Amen. Because we've got to be having this honest Communion with God. Communion means, you know, it means we're co. There's two. Communion. It means we're doing this together. We're doing this together. I talk for a little bit and you listen. And you talk for a little bit and I listen. And our Father wants that communion. <clears throat> but it, it's not to be a one-way conversation. It's to be a two-way conversation. And then he goes on to say there'll be weeping, gnashing of teeth. He said, they will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and sit down in the kingdom of God. And indeed, there are last who will be first. And there are first who will be last. You're going to have two great shocks if you make it to heaven. If you make it to heaven. Notice how to say when you get to heaven, because you might not be going right now. That's between you and God and how you live your life. But you're going to have two great shocks when you get to heaven, if you get to heaven. Who's there and who's not? It will surprise you. And you're going to have another great surprise, and that's who God exalts and who is not exalted. There was a preacher one time at a testimony that he had went to heaven and he was before the vast multitudes before the throne of God. And he said he was shocked because there were men that he had revered of being some of the greatest preachers on the earth. And they were way out in the crowd. And he, he, he interviewed them and he said, what are you doing out here? You should be right up there on the front row. And they said, no. <laughs> you see, we, we got proud about how great we were on the earth. And now we stand in humility with God. But those who were humble on earth, now they'll stand in greatness with God. God said the things that sometimes men consider least here. You know, something happened to me the other day, and I don't know if I finished this. I don't even remember if I shared this with you, but I was getting ready to leave the church. I think I did share it once, but it's, it's a haunting to me, Joe. I was leaving church, it's about 10.30 at night on Wednesday. I come downstairs and I get at my truck and I see Joe's pulling in in the van. And I got ready to drive by and I, the Lord said, stop and tell Joe 
I needed a ride to church and you picked me up. And I stopped and I looked at Joe and I said, Joe, Jesus just told me to tell you he needed a ride to church and you picked him up. And as I drove off, I began weeping. I'm about to weep right now because the power of God hit me. And he said, son, remember, the things you think might be small, I consider great. And the things you may think are great, I consider small. Because Joe, Joe didn't have a crowd meet him when he came. You know, you all applauded for me when I came on the stage, and thanks. I know I'm just the donkey bringing the king. I know the applause is really for him and what he's done. But when Joe brought the van back 10.30 at night, he had to get up and go to work in the morning just like you do. There wasn't a crowd at 37th Street. Oh, Joe, way to do it, man. You did it again. You've been doing it all these years, man. When everybody else is home asleep, you're just getting in the parking lot from taking people home who didn't have transportation. That's how God thinks. That's what his word tells us. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse one. Hebrews chapter 12, verse one. As for us, we have all these great witnesses who encircle us like clouds. So we must let go of every wound that has pierced us and the sin which we so easily fall into. Then we will be able to run life's marathon race with passion and determination. For the path has already been marked out before us. So many times, you know, most believe the apostle Paul wrote Hebrews. It doesn't really say, but most believe with the writing style it was him. But three times Paul uses a marathon as a metaphor for the walk with God. Three times he uses that. A marathon. A long hard race. And one point he says, only one receives the prize. Only one gets the winner's crown. He said, run to win. Run to win. You know, every morning, I believe, you know, when I pray in the mornings, I, I go through a, 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 a way of praying because I want to cover everything. And in my way of praying, one of the prayers I pray is the Lord's Prayer daily. Why? You can't improve on the method of Jesus. You can make up your own prayers or you can use the perfect prayer. He gave us the model prayer. And you know part of that prayer that we forget, I think sometimes as believers, to pray every day and there isn't a day you wake up that there ain't a demon ready to take you down. There isn't a day you wake up that there's not a demon ready to take you down. The day you think it's okay may be the day you go down. Because in that Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. How many of y'all pray that every day? Or do you take provision for granted? I'm an American. Even if I don't work, I can go to, there's 12 food pantries in this city. I can go over to Old Man Rivers and get a meal anytime I need it. I can go down to the, the, the mission down here. I can go to the Salvation Army. I can go to Latrobe Street. I can go and get a meal anywhere I want. Don't take it for granted. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is daily battle. Every day I pray and you say, well, I don't even know that I've sinned in the last 24 hours. 
Holy Spirit, what do I need to take care of? And who do I need to take care of? Because this prayer right up here, or this thing we just read in Hebrews said, we must let go of every wound that has pierced us. You got to let go of them wounds. People are going to hurt you. You'll get hurt in church. You know why you get hurt in church more? Because you have a higher expectation of people. I walk in Walmart. I don't expect everybody to be holy to you. I mean... But I walk in church, I have a higher anticipation. I have a higher expectation of people. Why, you're supposed to be the kids of God. You're supposed to be acting right. But don't forget, with every 12, there's probably a Judas. Jesus had the perfect church, and Judas attended every Sunday. Huh? And Jesus allows Judas to attend. Why? Because he even, I think, had hope for Judas. He has hope for everybody. The Bible says, let them grow together. Let the wheat and the tares grow together. Don't try to pull them out. Why? You'll uproot the good people trying to deal with the bad people. So there's things we have to do. There's things that we have a tolerance for. There's things we don't. Those are by the scriptures, not by our own likes and wants. So we got to let go of every wound. But this next part of the Lord's Prayer is a part that I think is part of getting dressed every day. I mean, I don't know if you've ever gotten so absent-minded you walked outside without your pants on. I don't think I have. Now, I was preaching one day. I I have a habit. When I find something I like, I buy multiples. Like if I find a pair of pants I like, I'll buy three pair because I know next year I go back, they won't be there. You know what I mean? You do that more when you get older. The way you know you're old is if you buy three pair of the same shoes because you're afraid that when you go back, they won't have them same comfortable shoes anymore. You know you're old then. And I'm not going to tell you how many pairs of the same shoes I have because I'm embracing my youth for another four days. Several of you said, happy birthday, Pastor Dave, this morning to me. And I said, not yet. I get to embrace my youth for four more days. But one part of this prayer we forget to pray every day is, lead us not into temptation and, there's a conjunction there, and deliver us from the evil one. Now, let me ask you a question. Wouldn't this be cool is if you had some kind of an app on your phone? Okay, let's so see, you had an app. There's an app for that. And you got ready to get in your car, and the app said, wait three minutes because there's going to be an accident, and you'll die if you leave right now. How many of y'all would wait three minutes? Wouldn't it be cool if there was an app for that? Wouldn't it be cool if there was an app for warning you of evil that was going to happen to you that day? Well, I got good news. There is an app for that, but it will not come on your iPhone or your Android or your flip phone, Gary. (laughs) Go and hold your phone up. Show Show us what you got, brother. Show us what you got. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Well, okay. You've been upgraded. Let me guess, Brooke ordered that. (laughs) Now, you don't know how to use it, though, do you? Come on, call me. (laughs) Oh, you got it turned off. Never mind. I, I, thank you, Gary. Hallelujah. He knows how to turn that thing off during church. Good man. Did you see where it was? It was in his pocket where it belonged. Amen. There is an app for that. Amen. Because when I pray at the beginning of a day, and when I awake and I'm facing that next day, and remember, with prayer, you can't store it up. You consume it daily. That's the thing about God, like messages. You think, well, I heard two messages this week. It's called, everybody say, daily bread, daily, bread. daily fed, 
daily lead. How many of y'all ever tried to do this? You know, a lot of you practice the art of fasting, right? Three of you? <laughs> You're supposed to. How many of y'all ever, before a fast, you thought, I'm going to eat and store up? Yeah. <laughs> and so you gorge. And you wake up in the morning, you think, I shouldn't be hungry for days because I just ate 12,000 calories last night, right? But when you wake up, guess what your stomach says? Feed me now. But stomach, you've been fed for days. And your stomach responds, I don't care. Feed me now, right? And guess what? That's the parable God used for our relationship with him. And that is, you can't store up prayer. You can't store up even his word in the sense of you've got to have a renewed word for every day. You can't say, you know, I had a, a cousin. He was being ornery with me one year. We were, went out to eat one day, and he's a believer. And his name's Kerry, and... We sit down to eat, and I said, whoa, 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 we haven't prayed yet. He said, I already prayed. And I said, you did? And he said, yeah. January 1st, I said, Lord, bless everything I eat <laughs> this year. I said, no, uh-uh, no, no, no. He, he was just joking. But that's how we act sometimes as believers. Give us this day our daily bread. Lead me not into temptation today. That's called getting dressed for battle. That's putting on armor. And deliver me from evil. There are evil people everywhere, even in church. We act shocked when we discover evil in church. And don't you know those 12 disciples were shocked when Jesus dipped his bread in that hummus or whatever it was. And they said, Lord, who's going to betray you? He said, the one whom I'm about to give the bread I just dipped. And he placed it in the mouth of Judas. <gasps> Turn around and look at everybody and say, you're not a Judas, are you? <laughs> Hope not. I would have sat over there if I'd have known. <laughs> You're not a Judas, are you? But guys, listen. Listen. It is imperative. It is imperative. It is imperative. Come on up, guys. I'm going to shorten this a little bit this morning because we want to celebrate our kids. <sighs> but it is imperative. Imperative imperative that you dress every morning for battle. And if you get, I mean, you've been here now for an hour and 49 minutes since the service started. And I'm telling you, if you get this one thing every day at the start of my day, I'm going to ask the Lord to lead me not into temptation and deliver me from the power of the evil one. That would be Lucifer and his minions. That would be Lucifer and his armies of fallen ones. That would be the hosts of heavens that rebelled against God. That would be under the principalities and the powers and the rulers of darkness and the wicked spirits. That's who we're fighting. And that will even give you a discernment to know who to yoke up with and who not to yoke up with in life. Because you know what my greatest warfare has been? And what it is, Nicole? Since I became a pastor, I've been pastoring people since 1983. Full-time since 86. And you know what my greatest attack of the enemy has ever been? No, not just people, church people. I said that to you because you're a preacher's kid. 
Have you seen your father weep more tears over a demon or church people? Have you seen your father weep more tears and your mother weep more tears over crazy stuff in the world or church people? That's why we got to learn to recover from the wounds. I mean, we got to learn to have a little discernment. You know, I'm, I, one of my weaknesses in my personality, and it's a personality trait, it's something God gave me, is I believe the best of everybody. I have a hard time seeing evil in people because I'm transparent. I think everyone else is. I can't hide nothing. I don't want to. And I think we all think everyone is like we are, but we're not. And so I'm thinking, well, I would never do that, so I suppose they wouldn't. I think, well, I've tried to form my character in a godly manner, and I think everyone else has, but guess what? They haven't. So we've got to be ready every day. And if I can just get you to commit, today. It's not, I'm not asking a lot, but it will take a lot for you to remember to do this at the beginning of your day because it's easier just get up and march on like nothing's bad's going to happen. But guess what? Has bad happened in your life? And how many days have you experienced something bad? And if we really trace it back, we'll find that day was not committed to Christ. In asking him to protect you that day from temptation and evil. I mean, we just anticipate it's a done deal. Then why would he have said to do it? Things are not automatic in the kingdom. Everything is on manual. You hear me? I was turning something on. What was I doing on my computer? And it said you know, turn on automatic. And I just thought, to, and I looked at the button, it said manual or automatic. Maybe it was an update or something. We assume in the kingdom it's automatic. Well, I've received Jesus, it's on autopilot. It's not. The day you don't acknowledge him may be the day you will need him and guess what? You're not dressed. We gotta be dressed for battle. Amen. Here's what I want to do this morning. We're going to ask you to stand. And we're going to sing a song. And I want you to just think for a moment. If you don't put a plan into action, then you'll fail. you got to have a plan. Without a plan, nothing changes. Amen. You can always change a plan. But without a plan, nothing changes. You stay the same. How many all ready to change? What if we just make this adjustment daily and we say, Lord, today, as we're, and I encourage you, go through the Lord's Prayer. It's not that hard to remember. Most of you memorized it as children. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of every sin as we forgive others. We let go of those wounds. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. Amen. Deliver us from evil. Let's sing this together and think about that and make the commitment to that as we sing. This is my worship. This is my offering. Every moment I withhold nothing I'm learning to trust you Even when I can't see Even in suffering I have to believe it If you say it's wrong Then I'll say If you say it I'm letting go If you're in it with me I'll be there When you say the trump I'm diving in If you say be still Then I will be If you say to trust I will open I don't want to fall In my own way I'm done chasing feeling
a burden But once I could grasp it You took me further Further than I was asking but Simply to see you It's worth it all I just saw this while I was praying. Now, whether it was inspired of the Holy Ghost or it's just me, I don't know. But either way, it's a good idea. I saw women going home, pulling out a tube of lipstick and writing on their mirror that they get in front of every morning, their family. Don't do this alone. Don't do this alone as a reminder and you might just put lead me not deliver me this day feed me this day maybe put a little reminder of the lord's prayer why you got to build these habits into your life they're called disciplines and that's what makes us disciples disciples are disciplined ones that's what the word means we build them into our life do whatever you got to do. There was a point where I was so addicted to television, I cut, my wife came home from work one day and thought I was crazy. Back then we had the, Curtis Mathis was the best TV back then. I had a Curtis Mathis 25 inch color TV, man. And that was using a big time if you had that. I had to mortgage the house to get it, you know. Wasn't much of a house, you know. But I, I, I cut out a piece of cardboard and I taped it to the screen. I said, watching this thing will cost me signs, wonders, and miracles. And we had no television for 12 years because I was purposed, I'm going to learn God's word. And I'm going to be a man who studies the word. And so entertainment was gone until I learned the word of God. And now entertainment still has only a small place in my life. Amen. I ain't got time for all that and you shouldn't either so make that commitment to God and watch your life change and you may look back and say wow you know what I haven't had a calamity in months that's the way it should be why you've prayed you'd be protected from that daily daily bread daily led Daily fed. Say that with me. Daily bread. Daily, bread. Daily, led. Daily led. Daily fed. Daily fed. Amen. Amen.